Hello and welcome back to the Not The Old Firm YouTube channel. My name is Ben Banks. Back to review a very successful international It's <laughs> It has been. I know you're going to... No, it's not. Because... Sorry, but no. No, uh, let, let, me fin let me finish my little introduction. A major tournament has been qualified for last Thursday, but there is obvious disappointment within the Tartan Army after two defeats in the Nations League groups potential chance to move into the Group A and play some of Europe's elite and as well potentially move a step. I don't think it's like a guaranteed on the playoff place for World Cup 2022, but it would definitely be a massive step forward for that should we not qualify through the groups, which are drawn next month. But defeat against Slovakia and a really disappointing result. And then again, 1-0 defeat to Israel tonight. Back-to-back 1-0 defeats in those games and Czech Republic have managed to turn the group around and win it fairly comfortably and then by a few points. Um, so disappointing for Scotland on that front. Um, yeah, you, you've got more frank views on it than I have, James, so I'll let you go off in your wee rant. It's not a successful week, I'm sorry, but no, that is not... How, right, how is it not a successful going, week? Going into this international break, Scotland had three objectives. Beat Serbia and qualify for the Euros. Get the few points needed to win group in the Nations League and get promotion to League A and take a step towards a potential World Cup qualification playoff place. They shat the bed in two out of three. So how... how I'm, I'm, because one of, them, one of them was overwhelmingly bigger than the other ones. Scotland done... Short term, aye, short term is a bigger one. Long term, no. Um, long term, yeah, it, it sets Scotland back a bit because we're now in the position where we had a really good chance to really add to our... A ranking points really put ourselves in position where we can really climb up the, the, the pots for future top uh, competitions. But because the players were, and I'm, I'm going to be quite blunt, I think we've been really quite unprofessional in the last two games. We're now more or less at the same position we were in this time 10 days ago. In what sense? We're still a mid tier, well, we're still a mid tier European nation playing other mid tier European nations. Um, we're now out of contention for that potential World Cup qualification playoff spot. And we're, and truth be told, in reality, looking at that group that Scotland has at the Euros next year, would you be surprised if this, based on the last couple of games, if that Scotland game returned for the Euros with zero points and zero goals? I think it, in mind of playing England, Croatia and the Czech Republic. Uh, well, you be genuinely it, I mean, Scotland for me are going to be the team of the Euros where they're not, none of the games are going to be 3 2, two each any of this. It's going to be 1 0 either way, pretty much. And we've seen that the last the last month we got that goal and we're able to keep clean sheets, but going the other way as well, we don't look like we've got two or three goals. I think I've seen us, I think that's now um, only twice in nine games we've scored more than two goals in a game, even one goal in a game, I think it is. Um, when, so when you look at the countries we've been playing against, what is it? Because when you look at the countries we've been playing against in those games recently, England, Croatia and the Czech Republic are a big, big step up for these teams. Look, many times have we played Israel in the last few months? Five since Five. You know, I'm pretty sure in four more to come now, potentially. Many goals have we scored? Well, we, we had that, that first game... Uh, James Forrest scored the hat trick, and then I'm pretty sure I've not got the games to hand with me, but it's been 2 1 defeat. I'm pretty sure you had a 0 0 draw, one each in 90 minutes, and then tonight. So they've all been fairly close and they've all been fairly split in terms of results. But so, what, so why, the, why would there be any any reasonable expectation to go and play the previous World Cup finalist and to possibly take anything from it? An England team who as much as I, I, I don't think they're any great shakes, they are certainly a level above Scotland. And when, we've played, when we played a, a shadow Czech Republic side and looked very poor against them. Hmm. I get what you're saying. Uh, perhaps the qualification mass it best should do. I'm not... I'm, it's the qualification, and I said this after the, the, the Serbia right, game. I'll ask, you this, I'll ask you this before you go on your rant. See these losing these two games, does this wipe off the success of qualifying for the Euros for you? Yes, absolutely. Really? Mm -hmm, completely. Oof, that's a big statement. But it's not, because nobody expecting... What's the expectations from the Euros? See, for the Euros thing, right, 
And if for, if for, if we're just going to go there to make up the numbers, there's no point going. You become New Zealand, you become Fiji, you become Iraq, Iran. These pissy countries that go to World Cups and rack up six, seven nil defeats, but they're there for the day out. And it's you know that see if that's why we're going. There's no point going. Seeing this right now, obviously we all want Scotland to go there. We want Scotland to do well, but. You know, I'm literally basing this on literally zero stats. I'm not basing this on how well we've played, what formation we've played. The Euros next year for me is about Scotland fans actually able to release a generation of Scotland fans being able to realise what their grandpas, dads, mums, aunties, grands have spoke to them about for 23 years. That's what next summer's about. And yes, would it be great to go to the Euros and progress through it and have a Northern Ireland style Euros? Yes, but for me, that's not what it's about next summer. But this, and at least for at least from my perspective, this is going to be unlike going to any tournament Scotland's ever been to because as poorly as Scotland have performed at major tournaments, I mean, certainly the ones that I've witnessed in my lifetime, you've always went to them thinking, you know, there is a genuine possibility of taking something out of some of these games. You know, Euro 96, and I mean, it's Switzerland, Holland and England in the group. And nobody would have said that you were going to go and be the whipping boys in that group. And they weren't. They, they got points again. They got a point against Holland, and then they bet Switzerland and went out in goal difference. France 98, it was Brazil, Norway, and Morocco. Now, all right, Brazil, free hat. They're not beating Brazil in the open game of the World Cup. Norway and Morocco, I think most people would have sat and thought, we could maybe get something from this. We can maybe get through the next round. Where we're sitting now, I can't imagine that even the most optimistic of Scotland fans is sitting here thinking, you know, we could maybe get through that Euros group. And this is a, this is a much expanded Euros where, I mean, Euro 96 was, I believe, off the top of my head, it was a 16-team tournament. We're now at a 24-team tournament, so we've, we've, we've increased it by 50% since the last time we were there. But now we're just happy to be there to make up the numbers. What's, what's the point? I think um, perhaps that's that. See, for me, as somebody that's not going to Scotland in a major tournament, I'm not saying I'd want Scotland to just go there and get beat 3 and 4 0. But I mean, we are going to be fairly happy to be there. I think. Now, obviously, do we want to go there and put on a good show? Aye. But we've been there for 23 years. I don't think it's our right to be sitting and going, oh, well, we should be going and we should be looking to get past the group's minimum. We've not been there for 23 years. We go into that group as complete underdogs. If we get anything for that group, great. I think but we, we should still be going at looking at it being something that we can actually take something I from. Think it not is. Just I mean, being a beat, big job. Uh, aye, we beat Czech Republic 1 0. I'm not touting that game away to Czech Republic because I think that was a complete, because it was a C team as well. I don't think you can really count that game. But when Czech Republic had their full team at Hamden, like they will do next June, Scotland were. It was even, but Scotland got the better of them. That, they didn't look all that great. They looked all right. They're probably better than Scotland as a unit just now. But Scotland also did manage to get the better of them. If the similar happens in June next year, there's three points, even a point. England, again, I think form goes out the window in that one. Just with the magnitude of how that game's going to be and the build-up to it, it's going to be so intense. And then Croatia, I think, is the one that's the free hit there, obviously, World Cup finalists 2018 as well as that. Although they have taken a bit of a dip in recent years since that. Um, they're still obviously one of Europe's better sides now, so I think that one for me is the three hit. Um, but I don't think we should be at this stage in November. We've still got a couple of international camps to go, still got domestic form to pick up for some players in the squad. So I don't think we should be just writing off the tournament as uh, we're going to go out 3-4-0 every game and we're going to just get, basically go and get battered. Um, I'll, I'll be interested to see how many Scotland fans remember it after the trips down to London and things like that. Um, but I, I don't want to be Mr. Pessimistic after two defeats, after what this group of players have achieved. They've already, despite these two results, um, they've already made themselves a historic group of players. See, if it was two defeats in the last two games, you could at least sit back and say, you know, Scotland actually played quite well and they were unlucky to lose. I'd agree with you. Those last two games have been utterly abysmal. And to go back to the previous international break before this one, we sat after him and we spoke about how bad that Scotland team was, but the problems about trying to fit square pegs into round holes like Tierney and Roberts in the same team at every possibility. It was shoehorning players into the team regardless of the form. 
And being Serbia has completely papered over that. People have gone, oh, well, bollocks to the problems. We've qualified. I actually seen one of, one of, the, one of the journalists that I follow on Twitter said it. It doesn't matter that we've just lost two games. We've qualified for the Euros. It's like, well, no, because the same problems that existed before, one, ultimately one game, the same problems that existed before that game still exist today. And I've, I've, judge, judging on what I've seen from Steve Clark and his 18 months in charge of Scotland, as Scotland boss, they're still going to be there in a year and a half's time. He's still going to shoot. So, like, we were saying this before we started recording, and I think it's kind of fair that I say it as we record. Scott McTominay. Now, I'm a fan of Scott McTominay as a player. I've said it several times that I like Scott McTominay as a footballer. He's not a centre-back. And if he wasn't a Man United player, Steve Clark wouldn't insist on playing at centre-back. If Scott McTominay was a Hibs midfielder or a Motherwell midfielder, he would play in midfield or he would play in midfield. He would not be playing at centre-back. But because he plays for a big team, Steve Clark insists on playing them. Tierney and Robertson. If one of those two played for Hibs or Motherwell or Harps, they wouldn't be shoehorned into the team. But because they play for Arsenal and Liverpool, they've got to be shoehorned into the team. Lee Griffiths. Oh dear. What's the point? I keep, I keep saying that Lee Griffiths is some kind of superstar goal scorer. What age were you in 2017? What age was that? <laughs> you're asking. Uh, yeah, maybe, what age were you in the last, the last Scotland-England game? Uh, that was 2017, so I'd have been uh, 14 or 15. Right, that was that was the, the same spell that Lee Griffiths scored his last Scotland goals in. This is a guy who went... I mean, we're going to be all out Burnley not scoring goals. McBurney, I think he won his 14th cap tonight, 15th cap. 15th cap. 15th. It took Lee Griffiths 12th to score his first goal for Scotland. Were we writing him off at the time? Were we saying Scott, were we saying Lee Griffiths should never play for Scotland again? The guy is shite. No, we weren't. We're going to give him time, give him time. He's great. He's this, he's that. He scored four goals in a couple of games and hasn't he scored since. Now, I think that argument you would make. As we have spoken about many a time and disagreed many a time on domestic form and what that means for international form. Now, people look at Lee Griffiths on the domestic scene this year and you see him coming off the bench for Celtic. First or second touches is scoring goals left and centre off the bench. How do you bring that to Scotland? Is he going to be a starter? Potentially, probably not in these games. He's something off the bench. But then again, you've seen in the game tonight, it was perhaps lacking a wee bit of sharpness at this level. He finds that bit of space in the box. He tests Marciano. Ollie McBurney, I have been a massive defender of him. I think he is given an absolutely horrific time by Scotland fans. And I just wouldn't be surprised just on the sheer amount of personal abuse he gets if he just pack, decided to pack it in. Because even though I think criticism of his overall play is warranted, especially in these last couple of games, because I don't think he's shown a lot to prove himself at this level, some of the stuff gets really personal and I think it's pretty awful. But, again, he's, he also has it, he has played 15 games and scored zero. Regardless of Griffiths, if you take McBurney in isolation, he needs to be doing better to stake his claim for a starting 11 spot. Absolutely, he does need to be doing better. Uh, I, com- I completely agree with that. I mean, you're looking at this squad. If we're talking about Lee Griffiths' domestic form, why is Kevin Nisbet not in the squad? Lee Griffiths has played 133 minutes of club football this season. 133 minutes. Uh, I definitely think, Kev, the strikers in that. I did an article today on a couple of players that should be in that Scotland squad, and I think Kevin Nisbet's probably got this. In terms of the players who haven't been capped or are on the periphery of just about getting capped, they should be definitely having a look at him. Because if you look at the striker options, McBurney, Griffiths, Shankland, even Patterson, you can only really say Dykes is the only one that's a standout he's going to play every week. And even at that, I wouldn't say Dykes is a 15-20 goal a season striker. He's more of a hassle and he needs to flick balls on to a, to a Nisbet type striker. Um, so I think Kevin Nisbet's one that definitely has to be in the squad next time. I'm going to go back to something else that I mentioned at the last break, international break. Steve Clark's inability to make substitutions which change a game. Go on. Like for like for like for like. That's the one I love to criticise 
Um, Steve Clark, I think he has done, considering where the Scotland national team was, he has turned around very well but in these last few games. Even the Serbia game, before, if that game had went the wrong way for Scotland and Serbia had nicked it, people would have been absolutely lambasting his decision to bring on Callum Patterson and Ollie McBurney in that last few minutes because ultimately they didn't contribute anything. And it was the same on Sunday, the subs didn't really work and then again tonight the subs didn't really work. So that's probably the only thing you could potentially point at but I loathe to point too much criticism at him um, after the sort of, because he did get a fair amount of stick, especially early on, maybe in the first few games of his reign saying it wasn't all that changed, but I think you can tell, even though I think you're going to disagree strongly, is that this Scotland national team, if you compare it to when he took over for Alex McLeish, is in a much better place. In what way? In that we're in a major tournament, they actually look bothered and want to be there. There is a so, system in place that can work if things go to plan. Obviously, I think he, the attacking things, there, but I think it's and it's maybe a Kevin that's a bit away from being solved. How big a part did Steve Clark play in taking Scotland to Euro 2020? A massive part. And I know what you're going to say, Alex McLeish was the one who... Oh, well, those two games that he managed? Yes. He, managed, he put in the systems in place and managed to get Scotland over the line, so he did play a part. What about the games that brought us to the playoff? What? What about the games that actually got us to the playoffs? Yes. Do you have any more important? Alex, well, there is equal importance, I think. Alex, right, so... Alex McLeish played a big role, and so did Steve Clark. I don't think there's any point putting well, them up against each other. Right, so McLeish, let's, let's just say they played an equal part, OK? Hmm. So we'll, we'll give them 50-50 credit. Fair I think it should be a bit more skewed to McLeish, but we'll give them 50-50 credit, right? So has Steve Clark taken us out of Nations League, League Group B? No, not yet. Where were we when Steve Clark took over as Scotland manager? He had, this is his first time. I think that's been harsh. This is his first time at this league. Right. He's had two, he had two games. All I had to do was win one of them. And we were promoted. And what way is that too harsh? I think the truth of what he's achieved. Would it, would it have been too harsh to criticise, to, to have said that had we lost to Serbia, if we were critical? Mm-hmm. No. Two games, still the same. No, but we didn't lose to Serbia, so that's the thing. I'm not going to go looking for... But name. we did lose these two games. I think it's, I think that's been a negative slant on it. Of course, disappointment after these games, but you need to view it in the context of, yes, it's disappointing to lose this group, but I've seen so many people on social media going over the top. Um, it's basically like the negative reaction to this game compared to what the nation was like a week ago just blows my mind a wee bit. But is that not because we overreacted to a week ago? No. Because we played for our first major tournament in 23 years. That reaction was 23 years of waiting. Now, to be fair, expanded, like a good an expanded year. tournament that, by all rights, that Scotland have no reason not to have been in. It's, 20, it's a 2014 tournament now. Actually, yeah, all the nations of Europe were in it. Scotland are in a major tournament. Right, but my point is, is that if we're going to... And, yeah, it's a great achievement getting to the Euros. But we need to remember that it's 24 out of 53 teams. Now, if, we're, if, if we can't make the, the argument that we're, we're in the top 24 teams in Europe, we're as well just sacking us off completely. And I, and I genuinely mean that. If, if, if Scotland aren't in a position where we are one of and I'm not saying that we should be up there with Spain and Holland and Germany and Italy and France, but we should we should be there with your mid-ranking teams like your Norways. Can can anybody seriously argue to me that, that Norwegian football is streets ahead of Scottish football? Domestically, yeah. I think um, I was speaking to somebody before. Who was it? Uh, Aberdeen v Viking. I was speaking to a journalist before, and he says domestically that Scotland are probably ahead of most nations like Norway, like Sweden, on the domestic scene, but internationally. And I don't know, I don't know why that is. Why why is that not translating then? That, and, that, and that's the problem. Because like you look at teams like Norway, right? So you've got an all oh, right, Haaland's very much a, 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 an outlier. You know, Haaland is not the, the kind of typical thing, but you look at these players and are we getting anybody close to that? 
And I know you might you might want to point to Robertson or Tierney, but when you look at how they perform for Scotland, they're, they're nowhere near it. They're bog average. I would say I would argue with Robertson. Robertson, I would say, has still got a wee bit to prove in a Scotland jersey. And I think you could see tonight that Tierney... he's a Scotland captain. I am. He's the but... cap. He is the one that everybody should be looking to to set the example. To turn him and go, he's still got a bit to go. No, no, I'm not saying that. Nah, he's got a bit to captain. prove. I mean, he's got a wee bit to prove in terms of actual. He's skin. a captain. He's Why is he got the arm behind I think got... he was rested on Sunday. Is it because he plays for Liverpool? He was rested on Sunday and Tierney played that left wing back role. And I think if you looked at the two performances between the Slovakia game and this one, there was a very good argument to say Tierney's much more suited to that left wing back role than Robertson is. Which then brings about the debate oh. Tierney can play at centre half a lot easier than Robertson can. So it brings the argument of, well, you can't drop the captain really, but you can you can't really fit you the don't have him as your captain. Tierney for me has um is probably in terms Look of Look at both of the performances at left wing back, right? And, and you can go right back across all of their games for Scotland. Can you ever think of Andy Robertson being particularly dominant on the left and being the man who really made Scotland tick. There's been a couple of games, like the game <laughs> the game against Cyprus, for example, he did fairly well in. Cyprus! Now, for specific games, but what I was going to say... It's, it's just a big British army base. He's not particularly shown. And in the Serbia game, I thought he probably had his best game in a Scotland shirt in a while, as did many of those players on that night. But... Overall, he's probably got a bit. If you had to pick one of the two as your left wing back, who do you pick? I probably you only get to pick one, and, and and I'm not going to. You don't like without going well. If you move him here, and whatever else, it's just a straight pick. There's no one goes to left centre back, and, or one goes here. It's Tierney or Robertson. Which one do you pick? I think on current form now, you need to go with Tierney because he has shown that he can. Right. Even at left centre back, he has been fairly decent. I think he's probably. He can play there no baller. He's played there for Arsenal. But mm-hmm. he did look a lot better at left wing back as well. Even though he's still good at centre back, he looked a lot better at left wing back. Than Robertson's he obviously he's a world class player, Robertson, in the domestic scene. I think sometimes Scotland fans forget that, but of course oh, Liverpool, absolutely. But of course he needs to translate those performances into Scotland Church. And perhaps I don't know, maybe the maybe the way because he plays at such a high level for Liverpool, perhaps that weighs him down on the international team. I don't know. No, I'm no, I'm not having that. No, that's if Andy Robertson can't play at the same level in a dark blue jersey, there's no red jersey. There's something seriously wrong there, um, and they, without question, should not be the captain if that's the case. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to round this back. I'm going to do some. Sort of, I'm going to try and do some sort of hosting and round it back. Um, so. <laughs> I, I love to ask this question because I think I know what sort of response I'm going to get back. How do you view this international break for Scottish football? Please say something positive. Papering over the cracks. Oof. But Ben, see a few weeks ago, you agreed with mm-hmm. huh? and, and, and that's exactly what my point is. Had, had that one game not happened, We'd all be sitting here looking at it and going, well, it wasn't, it was nowhere near good enough. We should be doing much, much better. But because of, and as I say, I've said it before, and I'll say it countless times, that getting to Euros is a great achievement. But you can't go, well, we've got to Euros, so bollocks to everything else. Because it just hurts us in the long run. If we put in those types of performances that we've put in in the last two games, over the next few games, see, we ten euros are finished. We're back to being one of these piss poor companies that we've spent the last twenty three years trying not to be. But all that aside, we did win that game, and really, I did sit here maybe after the September games. Not so much the October games, but definitely the September games. One them did the three five two work. Did Scott McTominay right centre half work? Can you really fit Robertson in the same system? I'm just saying these are the things I said as well, and I was perhaps too hasty, to be fair. Steve Clark, for me, has been trying to work out a system for the last, since he was in the job. He looks to have got it working in October-ish. He got the 
clean sheets right and he managed to nick goals. Let me finish. Let me finish before you butt in again. He managed to get the systems right and he won by the odd goal. That's how that system, that's how Kilmarnock played. They managed to get 1-0, 2-1 victories here and there and everywhere, right? But again, this month you got the part of the draw where it just doesn't fall for you. And whilst they were still as good defensively, I thought Declan Gallagher again over these last three games has proven he's Scotland's best centre-half by a large distance. He was immense in these couple of games. And I think it... I find it hard to sit here and go, he was crap, he was crap, when they've achieved something that's never been done in my lifetime. And I know that's a very happy clapper, nice, nice, pretty view of it, when of course there's, there are things to improve upon. You've seen that, it's very o- obvious in the Israel game, but I don't think now's the time to be picking the bones out of the total negatives of this team. I think we should, even though we can look back on and say things to improve on from these couple, last couple of Nations League games, I think overall you can't view this international break as anything but a success because major tournament qualification has been achieved. After 18 months in charge, if he's now only got a system that might work once every three or four games, that's that's I'm, that's not good enough. And as much as you can go, well, that's how Kilmarnock played. Yeah, that is how Kilmarnock played. How did that work for Kilmarnock? They got to third in Europe for the first time in a very long time in their history since then. And then what happened? He left. He got knocked out by a Welsh Garden Centre. Ah, it wasn't there. In Europa League. That's not ah, he, nice wasn't there. he wasn't there, but it was his team. It was I'm not blaming setup. Steve Clark for the uh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not blaming Steve Clark for it. It's a bit what, I'm, what I'm saying is that system is not a foolproof system. That is a system that works sometimes. It doesn't work consistently. Alex Dyer took continued that system. The Alex Dyer worked hand in glove with Steve Clark for a long time at Kilmarnock. He took on that system. He took on those same players. And you go back to a Welsh garden centre. That was Angelo Alessio. Let's, let's go. Oh, sorry, Angelo Alessio. Sorry, my mistake. Angelo Alessio. But again, it was, it was what, literally weeks after Clark was out of a job. That's, that results nothing to do with Clark for me. I know it's the same group of players and tactics perhaps wouldn't have changed much in that time, but that's Angelo Alessio's job and the Kilmarnock team. That's nothing to do with Steve Clark for me. Um, no, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's his thing. What I'm saying is in, in terms of how, how he's setting things up, if it's... You're wanting to set something up, particularly at this level with this group of players where... And I think at international level, when you look at most big international teams, they have a system that... You know, it doesn't matter who it is, when it is, where it is. They typically have this system. Now, that is not an argument that can be made for Steve Clark. Steve Clark went four at the back for long enough and went, oh, shit, this isn't working. Let's try three at the back. Oh, shit, this isn't working. Let's go back to four. Let's go back to three. Let's go to five. Let's go to three. Let's go to five. There's, there's no consistency there. He can't make up his mind who his left back is. He can't make his mind up what his defence is. He can't make his mind up what his best midfield is. He's picking players out of some sheer loyalty based on very, very little. Craig Gordon. Craig Gordon was picked on the basis of a save against Hibs and a clean sheet against Arbroath. And and a fairly decent game for Hibs this season. Go on. Against part-time teams in the Championship. Come on. Come on. Are we picking Charlie Adam next? Know, maybe. Would, would, would you would maybe. you seriously make the argument to pick Charlie Adam on the basis of his performances for Dundee and no, why not? No, you wouldn't. And I know that you wouldn't because I, I can tell you the way you're reacting that you're not wanting to say no. <laughs> I, I why does that apply? Why does that apply to Craig Gordon? Because <laughs> Craig Gordon's a well-established goalkeeper who's been probably half the best player and arguably alongside Adam the championship. They're in the championship. Lauren Shanklin was in the championship. If they was climbing, they have him. And look how that one worked. That didn't exactly go particularly well. I think, even for how you. Long, how, how long did the Lauren Shanklin experiment last for Scotland? It's still going, apparently. No, it's not. What? He's not. It's not. He's now very much a, a fringe player in that Scotland squad. It was when, Shanklin, when Shanklin first came into that squad, the idea behind that was you know, he was going to be Scotland's main man. He was going to be the one that was going to hit the ground running and show that he was playing at a level much beneath what he's capable of. And it turned out that maybe he was playing at the level that probably suits him the best. And people might disagree, but I, 
Lauren Shankland is very much a high end championship striker in Scotland. He's not a premiership striker for me. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I said at the time, Kevin Nisbet's a better striker than him. And I said at the time. And when, when they were in the championship, in fact, Kevin Nisbet also said it. Because it was at a press conference for not the old firm. I don't think he said <laughs> better than um, Lauren Shankland. No, but, what, what he said was if Lauren Shankland's in the Scotland squad, why am I not? Aye. And he was right. Because he's consistently outscored Shankland. He's generally more consistent. He's generally that brings more to a team. But Shankland got the hype train behind him. And the hype trains fell away now. And London Dykes has got it behind him now. And Dykes, as much as I criticise Dykes at times, I think Dykes has actually taken international football quite well. Um, he's probably been the one player in these last couple of breaks that came into the side and you're like, he could actually do a job. You know, he's one of the ones because of the one player. No, and the other was a kid that have just right. came into the side. Because no, because like, you're not talking guys like I don't know, like Callum McGregor, for example, has got 195 caps despite being bog average for Scotland in most of them. The ones that have just come in that are just relatively new additions to the squad. And there's other ones that have come in, you're just like, no, no, utterly pointless. The weird hard on people have for Callum Patterson. Right, I think we'll go to, um, seeing as you've got um, every, I think you've got enough negativity for every single negative Scotland fan you've just put out there. On this. And, and deservedly so. Scotland had a golden opportunity to put themselves into Group A of the Nations League with 1 1 from two games. But now it turns out we're not boogieing anymore, are we? Oh, that's not. I, I was going to bring that argument up, but I don't want this. I don't want this video. This is meant to be instant reaction. It's going to come out like a podcast by the time this goes up. Um, it's, it's needed because I, I think that, and just looking at the action on social media, particularly for journalists in Scotland, it's a case of let's just happy clap. Oh, we're going to the Euros. I we're going to get a jolly away in the summer. I think, uh, as I've already mentioned. I think that's a negative way of looking at things. But I do not want this video to run longer than it should be. So I am going to can it there. We hope, well, not so much enjoy, but we hope you found this somewhat interesting and enlightening. Um, please do remember to subscribe to our channel, like the video, we'll get plenty of content out on the channel. We'll have premiership reviews and previews up over the weekend as that returns, as well as we've had our League Cup review of the League Cup action that's been and gone and looking ahead to the last 16 as well. Some interesting ties in there. So do check that out. Uh, that's us for Scotland um, content. You'll be happy. Thank to... God for that. Um, but we'll, we'll probably will still revisit it in bits and pieces, but obviously we won't see as much Scotland national team coverage, at least here on our YouTube, although we will keep you updated on all the players. Can I make one more point? I want to make yeah. one more point. And it's, it's, it's not directly related to the Scotland team, but about Davy Proven. And you comment me. We'll leave that for there. You can tell me off record. Um, bye. Well, <laughs> well, I, I, I am already going to have to cut, um, go through this and just see what I need to pick out and stuff. So cut nothing. <laughs> so we'll see. But I, we'll keep you updated on what the Scotland players that are in and about this current squad are getting up to. So between now and March on our website. So do check that out and as well on our socials. We'll keep you updated with wee bits and pieces on here just when where we see fit but it'll be mainly premiership action and any domestic cup action we'll be focusing on as well as any exclusive interviews over the next few months so do subscribe if that's sounds fancy to you and um, we'll let james can we'll let james calm down after this please do remember to subscribe i'm perfectly calm like the video and until next time take it easy <laughs>